Hello carpoolers, this is the Christmas special carpool and I've got a very special guest I'm just going to pick up. Here he is. Oh, it's that's very nice. Hello there, Santa. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> oh. Jeez. Hello, Santa. All right. <laughs> Where do you need to I go? I need to get to the so John Lewis department the store. John Lewis department store, isn't yeah. that love? So you're going to be going there and meeting all the oh, children who are going to be... Oh, little fuckers. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> They're all going to be Comes sex. around once a year is too fucking often for this. <laughs> They're going to be, be sex every sex two years. <laughs> every two years, yeah. do you would prefer Christmas? What, well, once a, once a decade. It's yeah. a lot of work for me. Well, you must be hellishly busy I on am. Christmas Eve. I am. It's awful. No one thinks it through. <laughs> right. From my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> and now, well, presumably, what's happened to all your blaze and reindeers and all that stuff? Is that all? There's no enough snow to get no snow, is there? It never snows, it's global warming. Is that what it is? It's yeah. is it if everyone had electric cars, we'd be all right, but... <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing. There's no way of me... I've got to do it all on my own with a sack on my back. Fucking outrageous, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's awful. Right. It's awful. Uh, and I hate kids. I have to send me I could get the job, because they don't want anyone who likes kids too much. Of course, if you, were, if you were very keen on children. Yeah, that would be a problem. Yeah. I hate them. Right. They're so, you know, it's awful. If it was an it was an eighteen-year-old women, that would be perfect for me. But it's imagine not, just to picture that as a moment as Santa, <laughs> that you're sitting in your grotto and there's a queue of three hundred young, svelte women waiting to be, talk to you to sit on their lap. Well, that would be a different experience. That would be all... <laughs> Yo ho ho! <laughs> that Good. is marvellous. <laughs> so, thank you, Santa. Yeah, thank you, Santa. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> That is brilliant. <laughs>But no, the good thing is, which is true, and I don't do research, but obviously I really know about you a lot, but not, the, there's lots of gaps of yes. things, that, so I don't know where, because I, sort of, I connected you, because you're sort of slightly different generation of, well, you're much younger. The kind of, the group of old crones that I grew up with. Yeah. Well, the sort of comic strip generation. Yeah, and that yeah, lot. yeah, yeah. And yeah. then there was the Newman and Badil and you and all that lot, which were kind of all terrifying and incredibly <laughs> successful and really clever well, and much funnier. <laughs> I don't know, because you know, all that stuff, all the comic strip stuff especially, and uh, was what I was, I was growing up watching. Yeah, so I those, so, those, yeah. Were, those were my kind of, the, the, I think probably the young ones and um, and all that kind of stuff. And that when, when, Ke when Kevin Turvey, when R R R I was doing Kevin, Kevin Turvey, Turvey, that was the kind of thing that was, yeah. it was just the point I was really getting turned on to comedy. Right. So that was the, yeah. that was the, the big thing for me. And I was thinking the other day, actually also Tiz was, which when I was about five, I used to watch Tiz was, which right. was with Lenny Henry and, and, That's right. and Chris Tarrant. Yeah. 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 So they were probably the first That's TV quite, thing. That quite depressing to. that you yeah. were about five when that was on. Because <laughs> I was already old and quite jaded when that was on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, <laughs> Did you do university and all those sort of things? I mean, yeah, yeah, I went to- like measurably clever. <laughs> well, I, you know, I did well in my exams and got and went to a nice university and yeah, right. and I met Stuart Lee right. at university. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's where you met him. I'm yeah. Doing, yeah. So, um, and then we sort of started writing together. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been doing stuff at school, you know, which right. I, I just did a show called Headmaster Son a couple of years ago, which was, my dad was my headmaster at school. Wow. I was just in a comprehensive school in Cheddar. Right. But I had a, like a group of friends there that were just really into comedy and, and, and trying stuff out. So we even, you know, we'd done like little sketch shows and very derivative kind of Monty Python sort right. of stuff. But that was actually at school, at like school, on the school yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. so when we when I got to university, we sort of, it was unfashionable really, because everyone else had, stand up had really taken off in London. Yeah. And, and the university was sort of known for, review, for the sketches. And, right. And so we were doing like reviews and sketch shows. And, and it was when we went up to Edinburgh, we just had a really horrible time from oh, people really? like Keith Allen, right. who, who kind of sabotaged one of uh, <laughs> one of our shows and stuff, you know, and, and slagged us off on TV. And oh. and so we kind of, we because we, you know, we represented that old guard, that it was the Ox, Oxford right. Review I was in. So right. we represented that yes. old guard that, that thankfully the, uh, the comic strip and all the and the, and the comedy store and all those people came over and sort of overturned, you know. Which right. Was, but it seemed a bit unfair to because you can well, pick on that specifically. Well, it's yeah. always the, it's always the individuals. Isn't yeah. it? You go, you know, maybe there are <laughs> questions about the institution and their position, but you know, actually the people who are there. Are yeah. Just well, you know, it's funny because we'd all we'd all got to the, the university. To, all the people in that show, show had come through comprehensive school. I think all apart from one, you know, got right. good, good exam results. So it was exactly right. what you know you actually would want that. The, yes. That it's a meritocracy, it's a rather, meritocracy. Than, rather than people paying money to go. 
know, to a posh university, which I think still is the is the kind of view that people yeah. have. And you know, there's an element of that, but I think, but ultimately, want those we want all our educational institutions to be to able be to good. everyone and be good. To, it would yeah. be a good idea. Yeah. But, so yeah, that was so that, right. that was the starting point. And, then and that was you of, and I met Stu and it. actually Emma Kennedy, who does is in my oh, right. class. She was, right. she was there as well, right. and people like Ben Moore and Al Murray actually as well. Of course, right. Right? We, who was wow. the year below us, and uh, right. and Armando Yanucci was there as well. Though we didn't really know him very well till right. till afterwards, but. Right. Um, it was quite a golden time, I think, just suddenly, actually, ironically, as all, we were all being beaten up, uh, you know, yeah. metaphorically by everyone else, it was, there was actually quite a strong... So what year was that that you were I there? I was there sort of 86 to 89. Right. So we all around that time, and, and yeah, Al was the year below, and Armando was a kind of graduate student, Dave Schneider, Rebecca Front, who I love, is right. amazing, yeah. you know. But it, was, it was actually just this golden time, where there hadn't been anything since, really, since Rowan Atkinson, which was... A, which you know it was a good fifteen years, I guess, before. Right. So it was well, I mean, there was the the because the, the first year I went up was when the Perrier was yeah that first was on, and the, that for the was Cambridge Footlights. And that yeah, was, that, oh, that was Cambridge. That was Cambridge, Cambridge yeah. So but, that was um, Stephen Fry, Hugh yeah, Laurie, yeah. I mean, Emma Cambridge had Thompson. more of more more of a kind of history. Right, that, I'm I mean. with you. But, but Oxford right. kind of didn't. You know, we had that kind of same reputation. But also, I sort of think nearly everyone. Who has come out of Oxford and Cambridge as a comedian and have turned out to be kind of incredible Quite comedians, successful. you know, Peter yeah. Cook and yeah. the people in the Monty Python, the Monty they Python. are the people that you're kind of going, and, and Rowan Atkinson, and yeah. you know, you're kind of, these people are pretty good actually. So I know, and I think with comedy, yeah. You know, if, you, if people aren't like, you can't hold up your degree at the comedy store or at, no. on a Saturday night. Yeah. And go, well, look, I've got a two. Look, I am actually from, funny. From you Oxford that. University, yeah. you've got to be funny. You know? yeah, so yeah. I, I don't think I think those things can help. But yeah. well, conversely, I think Stuart and me were so un Oxbridge really in, in what we were doing. I wouldn't. I mean, if you that, if if it turned out that you'd both been to Brighton Poly, yeah. I wouldn't have been at all. You know, because you yeah. didn't come across ever no. as that. I didn't think of that. Well, whereas, I, whereas I kind of guessed with. Um, I've just met them again recently because I don't know them, but the guys that do the Now show, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of would know they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's think, not to denigrate them at all because I think they're very funny. No, and very but I think ironically, the people who were, if there was any of that nepotism within it, the people in the institutions who were be, who were Oxbridge didn't really get what we were doing. So I think, right. it, so I think if anything, it acted against us. You know, we we did our TV, we got onto TV, and you know. Uh, but I think the BBC were always a bit confused about us and didn't really know right. what to do with us, and, right. really, and you know, I don't. I, we struggled a bit to get, you know. We had a, we had Fist of Fun in '95, I think it was it aired, and then and then they sort of cha made it made us change the second series because they thought it looked too youthy, which was kind of ridiculous. They made us change the the set and the theme music, which I think right. slightly ruined it. You know, both Stu and me, and you know, we 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 last really worked together in 1999, so it's sort of ten years since oh, we God, worked. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. We've done a couple of little gigs together, but we haven't really. Yeah. And a doctor, an audio Doctor Who adventure for uh, real time, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But we, you know, we haven't, we haven't, you know, it's ten, incredibly ten years, and I think it's taken us both, though, you know, we got to the point ten years on where we both had to kind of start again, almost, you know. Yeah. I mean, Stuart a bit less because he was doing stand up all the time, and right, and that kind of was his established character. But you know, it, it's it's interesting that now I think we both. When people talk to you, they feel you know they talk to you as if we were big stars. Whereas I don't think we actually were at the time. You know, I think it was a very cult yes, thing. Yes, yes. Mr. Fun and this morning were very cult, and most people didn't. You know, out of a group of people, one person out of ten might be very excited about meeting you, and the right. other nine won't. Right. Will have no idea right. who you are. I've never seen uh, or heard. But yes, the people, the people yeah. who liked it, have stayed incredibly loyal to it. Right. And also, I think both of us through stand up and other things have built up our own individual audiences yeah. as well. So it's you know it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that eventually we're through. Being forced to work at it really because because people were a bit confused about who we were <laughs> and what yeah. we were doing. Yeah. But, you know, it's great. I mean, Stu's really you know th this last couple of years has really kind of hit his stride and yes. and, and got the recognition he kind of really deserves. Yeah. And when I started out, I really wanted to be on TV and be Rick Mail or you know be and be <laughs> right. a star. Yeah. Uh, and I think. Um, and I and I didn't really enjoy doing stand up the first time I did it in the kind of early nineties. Right. Uh, in fact, we're coming up to one of the first cl the oh, first really? uh, clubs I've played in. Uh, and we're, we're now in Acton. Yeah. Uh, uh, the King's Head. I don't think it's a. It's a I don't think it's a club anymore. But I, I had really hated and I didn't really like doing stuff for myself and, and convinced myself I worked with other people. And I wrote plays and did yeah. sketches and you know. But actually, I think in the last five years we've both realised that. If anything, TV's good to help you get a live audience Isn't rather than the other way around. Isn't it so, weird? It's exactly so, the opposite. Yeah. And, I, and I think uh, you know it's kind of nice to do a bit of telly, and it's in, the money's nice, and it's yeah. nice, and it's nice to just remind people that you exist. But yeah. but in fact, it's it's well, all I about. Think you're it's absolutely all about right. The, the whole thing is reversed. That 
you, you, you know, from a point of view of a young upcoming comedian who's presently at Cambridge or yeah. Oxford and doing really well, and they're really funny, and we haven't heard of them, and they're yeah. going to be brilliant. I kind of hate them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, like, because I don't, you know, but I don't know whether TV will be. You know, to those to those kids, I don't know if TV is the. You know, for it me, isn't. I'm TV, sure it TV isn't. was everything. You know, but I think that is. I think you know, it is quite exciting with all the where we are now on the internet and yeah. doing a podcast. You know, which is what I've sort of yeah really well, started getting into. But but I think you know that is that it is do it yourself, and everyone can have a go at that. And, yeah. In whatever way, you know, the technology is now cheap enough that you can yeah. at least borrow a camera and yeah. you know and exactly. easily just a, a computer and easily stick it up on the yeah. on the internet. And that's for, for me, that's very because it is it is sort of like going back to those early days of starting in the radio. We kind of came to London, did stand up circuit, and kind of worked our way up through writing for weekending and, and, and various right. radio four things, and getting our own radio show. You know, and and. And even that, you needed someone to commission stuff. You had to yeah. go through all this process, and yeah. someone, and then uh, even then, people were sticking their oar and going, "We need to change this. We need to change this." And you go, yeah. "Well, can we just do what we want to do?" Because yes. you know, I think we've got a good idea. And you know, we had, didn't have as much idea then as we do now. But I think you know, it, it, it feels like the TV and the radio executives. You know, I think especially now, I've been going for so long. I feel like I know more about comedy than anyone in that job is going to, is going to do. So you know, I've got a better idea of what I want to do. So yeah. to be able to just do it yourself and then make your mistakes and find it out and yeah. And to be able to give it out for free, because then I think, you know, then people, you know, people, if people haven't invested money in it and they're just investing their time in it, then, then you know, they're more likely to forgive any, you know, amateurishness or, or, or you know, or, or yes. things that don't quite work, because I don't yeah. this is exciting. But it feels, doing my, uh, you know, the podcast I'm doing at the moment, which I do one with Andrew Collins, and I do, I've just... Because you're doing two, aren't you? Yeah, 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 well, only only at the moment. I've been going with Andrew Collins for, like, nearly two years. We've right. Been, we'd, we'd, we'd done about, and coming up to 100 podcasts, oh, we, do it, we do it every yeah. week. But that's just me and him sitting that, in an attic so that's, that, all chatting. That's not a, in front of an audience? Well, no, it, not usually, but we are right. starting to do a few. So we did one last night in Brighton. Right. <laughs> and for where I probably got a little bit drunk and I'm not sure whether <laughs> I should have said something. <laughs> I should have revealed some of the things I revealed. I do like the fact <laughs> that you're a gobshite like me and you say the thing that comes out and then you go... <laughs> but then even then, with this, with a the podcast, they have to seek it out and yes, find it, you know, not, and so... Yes, you're not. And, and it, it does feel a bit like the Wild West and a bit like punk rock and, you know, that yeah. you can do anything because there's no one, you know, in our, in our podcast there's little bits where we've got, a, we've got a musician who does stuff and we've just started slightly parodying songs and not bothering about right. changing them too much you know anymore like if you're on the radio you, you have to go well we can't we don't, we'll, get, we'll get sued but you kind of think what, what they're going to do gonna, we'll give you a cut of the money we're getting from, yes, the, yes. from this so that we're we'll, raking give, it in. we'll give you 100% of, of nothing <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know but it'd be interesting to see where, when that changes and where, you know, whether there is a test case where where you know legality yes. comes into yeah. that, but at the moment it feels very free and easy, and you know I think that the, all that would happen is you take the the podcast down if it, if it becomes yeah. contentious. I never even really think of anything I do as offensive. You know, I kind of think I'm a comedian and I'm joking, and, yeah. and you know I think you get to a point where because we live this life and we, we have these conversations with each other and you know you push comedy further and further yeah. certainly in private that you kind of lose a little bit of uh, where maybe a normal person's view would be sometimes you know? you and right, you can yeah. sometimes push it a little bit yeah. you've got to be careful and I think you've got to really think about those things these things are all an issue but it is great to have the, the freedom again and I, you know, and I think it does it, he's doing these podcasts so they do the one with Andrew done for two years and then I just thought what would it be possible to do a sort of stand up and sketch thing that I actually do a bit because with, with Andrew we completely make it up so right. we, we just sort of uh, get there have the papers read them very quickly but we don't talk to each other and then we just talk well, it's sort of like this wow. we're just talking to each other but about the news and trying right. to be as funny as we can you know you're building up a relationship and it kind of you know it, uh, two years ago if you'd said that that's what we do I wouldn't have believed I'd be capable of talking for for an hour and, and six minutes and 36 seconds, which is just when the garage band thing cuts off. Because <laughs> we, we don't really know how to work out to use our computer. Uh, and, and be fairly consistently amusing. You know, there's obviously bits that aren't funny and there are bits yeah. that aren't meant to be funny and that are yeah. just more, more interesting. But, you know, we do pretty well with it. And it's kind of, I think as a comedian, that's an amazing thing to go, right, I'm just going to, I really want to be able to get to the point where I can go on stage and just chat and, yeah. be, you know, effortlessly But that practice, funny. in a sense, if nothing else, that, that muscle that you're using yeah. to do that, you know, to to uh, uh, suggest that to any form of uh, traditional broadcaster, yeah, to say what I want to do is sit in the studio for one hour, six <laughs> minutes, and thirty-six seconds, and just do some talking. Yeah, you know, it's just not going to happen. But, but any... whereas everyone knows that that if it works at all, if you've got an ounce of intelligence, it's going to get you're going to get better and better yeah, at doing yeah, it until course. it becomes a gem of a. 
And that's the thing, you know, thing, if you, before it? you'd have had to get your own radio show and work up by doing that, you know, and to do a hundred yeah. hours of, of, of broadcast, of broadcast on radio you know, would have taken a it's long time. So, so, you know, you, would, <laughs> you wouldn't have got the experience. So you, so you can absolutely do all these things. Yeah. Anyway. So I thought, can I do a stand up and a sketch show? And, and I, I did a radio two show a few years ago called That Was Then This Is Now, which was about what happened this yeah. week in history. And I kind of thought, well, you know, I, I'd wanted to take that on and just do it more of a stand up thing about myself and because of the blog and everything, just to look at what happened in the, in the week to me and in the world. World, you know? right. And Radio 2 were kind of just dragging their feet over a bit and and weren't, you know, and I think in the end I w weren't going to give me a series of that. And then I kind of thought, well, actually, I can just do this on my own. And if I, I felt with that, if I take, you know, I, I tend to play the Leicester Square Theatre with my tour shows in, in, in town in London. Right. And, um, and that's a 400 seat venue. And I kind of thought, if, you know, if I can get 200, 300 people to come and pay £10 to see that every week, yeah. then I'll actually make about as much money as, you know, there's very little overheads. I pay the cast a bit, yeah. a little bit, but they're happy to do it for nothing, you know, at the moment. And and so, you know, I'll actually, that, that's the way you could do the show and make money, but at least get your stuff out there, yeah. you know, and, and, and have people seeing it. And, you know, it, it, I think it's very frustrating when you. You have to wait for these people, and then they tell you you can't say something. And especially now, you know, people are so sensitive. So, and, and I think the actual public are mostly wanting to see comedy. You know, I think that's why right. live comedy is flourishing because they don't want to be nannied and they don't no. want someone to no. say you can't say. You know, you make that choice as a punter whether you want to watch Mock the Week. And if you decide you want to watch Mock the Week, you've got to know that there's probably going to be some things where they take the piss out of someone's facial yeah. nose, or you know, there's going to be that kind of slightly risque humour. That's yes. what the show is. There's right. a lot of shows that have just disappeared into the ether, and you kind of think that's a shame. Like, you know, yes. I, mean, I want to ever see that yeah. Christ on a bike again, which I might actually just do again because that was one of my favourite shows. But that's right. a show that never got recorded, you know. And um, was that a state a state show? Yeah, yeah. And was it about? It was about my relationship Lord. with Jesus as an as an atheist who's obsessed with Jesus, basically. And right. So it was, yeah, it was my first completely solo show from 2001 in Edinburgh. It was just right. you know, so it was just about trying to work out why. I was obsessed with Jesus, and but right, despite the fact I'm an atheist, and, I mean, because I, I, I hadn't heard of that. I mean, I think I've heard yeah. of your shows. Never didn't know you did that one. No, so but, that's, but that I mean, it just rings this huge bell because I'm constantly talking <laughs> to my children about Jesus. Yeah, and then they go, but Dad, you've always said you're an atheist. And I go, yeah, I know, and I haven't actually worked out yeah. how that works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was a very interesting show to look at. So I'd love to, you know, oh, I'm probably yeah. will do that again. Oh, but, brilliant! What but it just idea. means yeah. that those those shows exist, and then people, you know, and then. Ten years on, if everyone goes, oh, actually, he's quite good. They can go back and look yes. at the, the shows that they yeah. that they didn't notice. You know, six months of my year, I'm working on a new show, right. one way or the other. You know, working up, doing Edinburgh, and then touring it. And that, and and from that now, because you know, more more and more people are coming to see me every year. Partly, I think, because of the podcast. Partly because they've just <laughs> remembered me. away, you know, yeah. whatever, however they come to you, the, the audience is gradually building, and in, you know, it's, it's reached a point after putting in quite a lot of work in this decade doing. I think maybe seven or eight actual individual live shows, right. you know, and touring them. You know, it's getting to a point where it really is actually financially more than viable. You know, it's actually yeah. a great way to make a living. It's quite a harsh and lonely way to make a living yes, for that I mean, when you're touring. But I it's, find uh, that, that's the side I find very yeah. brutal. I mean, I have I, I have done it, and I, but I've done it for a while, and I did find that sometimes, even after a really good gig, yeah. I'd be driving home, <laughs> yeah. you know, and sometimes a long way, yeah, or yeah. you know, travelling overnight and then going. It's so lonely. <laughs> you know, I remember doing a gig in Cambridge, and it was a sold-out gig at the Cambridge Junction. It was a lovely venue, know, and like yeah, a big, lovely. you know, and you came off and signed all autographs and everything. Yeah. And it's on like a little trading estate, and I just foolishly yeah. just thought I'll stay. There was a travel lodge right opposite the venue, so I thought like, I'll stay there. Uh, and then, you know, but like literally, and the, the staff really loved there, but literally within five minutes of all this kind of adulation and love and doing that, and people going, yeah. and it, just suddenly the bar had emptied the stuff and oh, we're all going home. And suddenly I was stuck on this trading estate, heading back to this travel right. lodge, and knowing that uh, the travel lodge room I was in had a, a, a dried bogey stuck on the uh, shower curtain of the previous, <laughs> hopefully the previous resident. And I kind of, and I thought, I don't want to go and have a drink in the travel lodge on my own no. while, I, while I, but then I looked around and I thought, well, that's all I can do. So I sort of sat, Eat drinking a bottle of beer in the travel lodge, not wanting to go up to my room because of the shower curtain. And but I found it this year. I just found that really funny. I sort of sat there yeah. and thought, this is actually this is what show is it? Is yeah. it <laughs> that you have that false thing, and yeah. then you go to the real world, the and, real then world. You, and then yeah. you're avoiding a, a, a bogey on the shower, shower curtain? curtain. That is, it and is. it was actually I was able to really laugh at it and enjoy it, you know, and think, yeah. well, actually, it's still great to have a job where, you know, in most jobs you don't get like everyone <laughs> patting you on the back and yeah. no. offering to buy you drinks and after giving you a round of applause no. after you've done the, no. maybe 90 minutes of work. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's that's kind of a nice... Uh, yeah, you do have to keep it in perspective. You're <laughs> that's a, it's right. a nice yeah. way to make a living, but it is, you know, there's a big part of me. This this year it's 
you know, I, do, I don't have a tour manager, I don't have anything, I don't have a support act, so I do all the driving myself, wow. and it's uh, it's massively exhausting. I, yeah. and every year I say I'm going to get a tour manager, but then. Right. And um, what is the show that that you did? That was it? What, was that the, the Talking Penis one? Which was the one which was. That, that came out after because I remember seeing lots about that. And yeah, talking talking talk, cock. But that was I, talking cock. Yeah, was, so that, was, was that the vagina monologue? It was. I, I, when up, I, when it I, was when I talking cock. I, I just remember when I saw the poster, <laughs> just bursting out laughing, <laughs> just at the poster. <laughs> when I did, um, I did Christ on the bike in the I was at the Arts Theatre in, in Central London, and and it was I was sharing the time with the, the vagina monologue was right. on before me. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah and I did so, go and see it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it was. Uh, I think. Jerry Hall, maybe Sophie Dahl and people. It was different. Yeah. You know, the cast changes. Oh, all the gotcha. Time. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, you know, I was sort of doing this the Christ of Bike, which is the favourite show I've ever done, and you know, I think my one of my best shows. And like thirty people were coming at night, and it was, and then I'd, I'd be sitting backstage waiting to go on, and the vagina monologues would be full, right, uh, of people just shrieking with laughter at a show that I'd watched and thought, this is all, it's all right, and it's, yeah. it's you know, quite an important, and interesting show. It's not that fun. It's not as no. funny as these. It's not as funny as my show. No, I'm sure. and, I'd, and then every time in the bar afterwards, everyone's going, why don't you do um, the male version of vagina monologues? And I went, well, because everyone, because you thought of it, it's obvious, and, yeah. and, and it wouldn't work. Men don't need a show like this, and it's you know, and but then. I actually started really thinking about it and realised actually probably men do need a, a serious yeah. show about that, you yeah. know, a funny show, but a, that seriously talks about their yeah. genitalia because we yeah. don't have less than women. You know, women are much more likely to talk to each other about those issues, whereas men yes. just will not go with each other. I've got a, I mean, yeah. you might, men, a comedian men, might do it on stage, yeah, but, but men, not, men will just talk, but they'll talk about their cock constantly, but not honestly. So they'll just be no. like, I've got a massive cock and I, yeah. and I always get an erection, and you know, yeah. they will never go. Oh, I'm a bit worried because yeah. I can't wee if another man's standing next to me, unless yeah. they're a comedian. Was no. Right. So I wanted to do a show that was for men and women. Yeah. Uh, about you know men and women and, and men and men and women and women, yeah. but about about the penis's place in that and you know and it was actually I did a big questionnaire online for it uh, which I hadn't really thought that you know I just did that as a, on a whim almost thing well I might get some material out of it but I got so many responses and so much great stuff out right. of it and asked men and women you know and that was the difference I think okay in the vagina monologue she'd obviously interviewed some women and that's yeah, probably yeah. what I I thought that'd be a quick way of doing that but actually I had the brainwave of asking women about cocks as well as men and I got right. much more interesting stuff from women. Okay. And and just yeah. stuff that surprised me because you know, yeah. I think men, especially at that time, felt a bit like a bit battened down, a bit like we're we're all, we're all potential rapists yes. and the penis is a terrible thing. You know, you yeah. had you had that image, and then yeah. to actually see women being very positive about oh, right. about men, and you know, most of the time, and even women who had horrible things that happened to them, being very positive about most men. And, you right. know, and, and it made me realise, you know, oh god, you know, we're men, we're not as bad as yes, we're not an enemy know. in the human race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and actually, women women like men, and you know, all these yeah. things that just should be really obvious. And, and most of the things within that show were. Were, were really obvious points, you know, and but and also discovered that when you know when asked anonymously, men will admit that they're you know about one in three men, or one you know about a third of men will have an issue about right. size or something erection or whatever, yeah. you know, or yeah. something. So nearly every man will have something that they're worried about. Oh about God! That. Yeah. And then to yeah. read all those things and to realise that you're all in the same boat again, I think was a very uh, yes uniting experience. These things where people would just, you know, I think everyone has these little worries that will keep yeah. to themselves about that yeah. about these issues. And most unlike some of them, like you get some really sad stories coming through from issues that really weren't important. You know, there are some things that are are difficult. Yeah. You know, as there are in all, in all aspects of life, and there are yeah. things that are harder to live with. But there are things that really weren't an issue. You know, people with above average penises who who watch pornography and they think they've got small penises because yes. they don't know that these men are filmed from underneath and shave off all their pubic yeah. hair and obviously and have slightly larger penises yeah. than but not most people. Yeah. But not that, but actually not that much. But if you were to film your own penis, erect penis from underneath and shave off all your pubic hair, which I'm probably I don't know why I'm saying this, yeah. you've yeah. probably done well, that. I think it's it. important. But I, <laughs> I think it's but important that all men <laughs> at least do that once. You should but do try it once because you'll be quite impressed. <laughs> but try not to do it just before your mum walks in to tell you tea's ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the one I did. Was I was influenced by? We may as well talk about penises because I haven't on carpool before. But there was a film that I saw at a very formative age. I think I was probably 16, 17, called. Uh, it was about Wilhelm Reich. It's right. called WR Mysteries of the Organism. I saw it in Oxford. Oh yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard of it. And uh, it, I mean, I'd love to see it again now because I can't imagine what. <laughs> I, but what I, one of the <coughs> things that really hit me was the. Uh, they're called the Phantom Chicago Plastercasters. Oh, yes. And they're a bunch of groupies that plastercasted yeah, yeah. rock stars. Yeah. That's it, yeah. And so and they filmed them doing it. Yeah. They were doing a, a, a drummer who I'd never heard of, who just, it was just a crippling vision of embarrassment <laughs> for this boy. He clearly wasn't that crazy about doing it. Yeah, yeah. And he was being filmed by loads of girls <laughs> who were all looking at him, and then one of them was putting rubber gloves on to get the plaster ready. Yeah. 
was cruel. So, but anyway, I went home and, and I had there's that classic cusp between uh, you know childhood and and sort of masculine <laughs> maturity because yeah, yeah. I had plaster Paris left over from the model railway I was building. <laughs> so I cast my thing. I tried to very hard. Uh, yeah. My mum was down at my family. I was in my family home, you know. It was only, and, uh, and then, and it was at that crucial moment where it did seem to be working. It was setting, and it was, you know, maintaining the. Yeah, it's interest. very hard to maintain the. And then my mum did call me down for tea, and, that, and it was a screaming panic because you can't go down for tea with four and a half pounds of plaster stuck to your knob. Oh, if only I'd uh, interviewed you before I wrote the show. <laughs> that would definitely. Oh, you could have used that. One. It would definitely. Well, be I put it. I wrote. I used that in a book. I wrote. Oh, about, you? Wrote about doing Red Dwarf because about having. Your head cast. Yeah, oh, yes, you know, of course. It just yeah, came. Yeah, yeah. I'd forgotten all about it. And I suddenly went, Of course, I have actually had a part of my body cast before. <laughs> the bit I didn't do was the Vaseline and the not and the very, very yeah, diminutive be, amount of pubic hair I had at the time. Was you've got all, to be careful. I all think stuck don't, in the do it, don't do it yourself. Yeah. I think that might be quite dangerous. <laughs> don't try. Uh, it. Someone lost all their fingers putting plaster of palace something all over their hands, didn't they? Some, oh, there was an awful story about that. Oh, so no, don't be really. Be, oh, really, yeah. be careful. Well, you've got to be careful. <laughs> With that, you don't want to be very careful. And mine did look like when you know, when you open the vegetable drawer in the yeah. fridge and there's the old carrot that you haven't used it wasn't an impressive <laughs> casting quite a funny thing uh, uh, me and Stu did a <coughs> Stu's idea when he did a show called Club Zarathustra uh, but one Christmas he made me dress up as Father Christmas with a gas mask on just with a bit of a topless uh, and it was called Frightening Father Christmas and then I had to kind of go amongst the crowd sort of sexually molesting them and handing them uh, pet presents that all had pictures of a wrecked cock stuck on them and that was for, it was this kind of surreal kind of Dada-esque kind of cabaret thing, but it was actually an amazingly liberating and weird thing because you were anonymous with this little yeah. gas mask on you, and you, I was meant to behave like a gimp or whatever. You right. know, and he, he would control. If I'd went too far, he would kind of whip me or, right. run, or something. I can't remember what it was, but but it was just sort of weird to be going amongst an audience like as this kind of beast. You know, it's, yeah. it's almost some kind of. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. I'm, cool. I'm going to say thank you very much now. Thank you, Richard, because you've been <laughs> fucking brilliant. That's no, it's wonderful. been fun. It's been really, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> Really good. In a man. car. Yeah. <laughs>